1947, unrest on the waterfront early in the year put a spanner in the all-out effort to restore industry to a solid peacetime footing. Once again, the Sydney Warpies were on strike, opposing overtime. Manley's liberal MLA Darby harangued a large crowd in the Sydney domain, only to be pulled from his stand. Police moved in to quell a near riot, and next day, 25 men and one woman, including several leaders of the Communist Party, appeared in court. 88 ships lay idle, causing a pileup of a quarter of a million tons of cargo. University students organized a demonstration protesting against the Dutch policy in Indonesia. A demonstration outside the Dutch embassy which provided several thousand onlookers with one of the wildest scenes in Sydney streets for many years. Members of the Eureka Youth Movement joined in the clash with police as banners and placards were torn down, men and women sent sprawling in the hectic melee. Lunchtime city workers crammed the outskirts of the battleground, but no one was seriously injured as more than 50 agitators were bundled into police trucks. In direct contrast to the atmosphere of these two demonstrations, a crowd of more than 10,000 listened to speakers of the Bank Officers Association protesting against the Chifley government's plan to nationalise banks. The switchback from wartime schedules to peacetime production saw factories throughout the country struggling to obtain adequate staff, particularly in the female field. But the girls were not interested. Employers devised an extraordinary variety of baits designed to lure the much-needed skilled operators back to industry. But the response to the gimmicks was only lukewarm, and although more women were in employment in New South Wales in 1947 than before the war, the female workforce was still more than 25,000 under strength. Free hairdos, uniforms, transport, fashion parades, cigarettes. Huge sums were spent on playing fields. Lunch hour entertainments were staged. With employers combing the local labour market, Immigration Minister Arthur Caldwell spent three months overseas seeking new Australians. Welcome back to, to Australia, Mr Caldwell. We're very glad to see you again. Thank you, Mr Thomas. I'm sure glad to be back. That's good. You've been around quite a lot, haven't you? I have. I've seen 23 countries in 12 and a half weeks. And uh, I didn't dally anywhere, no. I can assure you. Well, how did you find conditions in Britain? Uh, they're pretty grim. They? Britain is... Uh, waging a great battle at the moment and I think she'll come through all right but her struggle is a struggle for survival and revival. She's got to maintain uh, her economy, she's got to recover a lot of her lost trade. But I think she'll get out all right. There's been a tremendous amount of interest in your mission Mr. Cole. Would you say that it's been a success? And, oh yes, it was a success all right. Good. We've got so many people uh, around the world now wanting to come to Australia that uh, if they all came here, well, we just wouldn't know how to house them and uh, we'd uh, complicate our economy. But we can take them all in due course and we'll take them as we get ships for them. We can't get all the ships we want, but uh, our prospects are improving. I think we'll get an aircraft carrier to bring people here. I'm not without hopes that we'll get the Aquitania. Into Sydney came the Dutch liner Joanne de Witt with 700 Jewish migrants, the largest group ever to land in Australia. Most had spent the war years in concentration camps and were stateless. They came shedding tears of joy in anticipation of family reunions after years of fearful separation. In a crowded round of last-minute official duties before returning to England, the retiring Governor-General, the Duke of Gloucester, presented two Victoria Crosses to young West Australian plumber Ted Kenner of the 2nd 4th Battalion for heroism at Weewak in New Guinea, and to Lieutenant Colonel G.W. Anderson, who earned his decoration in Malaya. Three days later, the Duchess and her children were on their way home. Several thousand flocked to Darling Harbour to bid farewell to the Duchess and her two sons as they boarded the liner Rangitiki. Prince William was first out of the car and first up the gangplank. The Duchess was escorted by the acting Governor-General, Sir Winston and Lady Duggan. There were several hundred other passengers, London-bound, but all eyes were on Prince Richard as he took his place at the rail like a seasoned traveller to see, for the first time, a typical Australian streamer departure.
On the advice of Prime Minister Ben Chifley, the King had appointed William John McKell to succeed his brother as Governor General, the 11th since Federation, but only the second Australian-born appointee. He had led the Labour Party in New South Wales for nearly six years as the Premier in the 50th and 51st governments. A Redfern boilermaker who displayed extraordinary talents to rise through the trades union movement, studying law with such application that he became a King's Counsel, and then on March the 11th, 1947, in Parliament House, Canberra, achieved his highest goal, the Governor Generalship, the personal representative of the monarch, a post he was to occupy for six years. In the course of a world tour which had already taken in Russia and the Orient, Field Marshal Viscount Montgomery of Alamein flew into Canberra where he was welcomed by our new Governor General and Prime Minister Ben Chifley. In Melbourne, more than a quarter of a million people gave the famous soldier a thundering ovation on his visit to the Shrine of Remembrance. The hero of the Western Desert who had outfoxed Rommel was a striking figure in battle dress. So crammed were the streets of the southern capital that his arrival to the town hall was 32 minutes behind schedule. A resounding tribute to the man who'd first visited these shores as a babe in arms. Loaded down with his tools of trade, Lancashire-born banjo ukulele strumming comedian George Formby flew into Sydney with his wife, bringing a message of thanks to Australia for the many thousands of Food for Britain parcels. Well, what, what about this? Here, <laughs> oh, oh, you were asking me the question. <laughs> I'll say I'm glad to be here, yes, but what about all this sunshine you promised? <laughs> Mr. Martin here said, when you get to Sydney, said, oh, the sun will shine, you'll be as warm as toast. I've been frozen ever since I've been here yet. <laughs> but it's really grand to be here, and I'd like to take this opportunity of thanking the folks in Australia for all the parcels that they've sent home to England. Believe me, folks, we're going to need them more than ever now. It used to be three eatless days, now it's three, three meatless days. Now they're not going to eat at all, so they tell me. <laughs> Just a minute, we'll take that flap again. <laughs> yeah. Well, folks, we're going to appreciate those parcels more than ever now. It used to be three meatless days, now it's going to be three eatless days. <laughs> I got it right that time. <laughs> Now listen to Jack Davy as he tells in his own inimitable way of some monkey business at the zoo. In jockey shorts, her wedding gown. Her husband would be very handy, so they've got her a bloke named Bandy Andy. They meet at last and, oh surprise, Keithy's twice young Andy's size. But what a size at a time like this. Marriage is really hit and miss. Says Keithy, this is the scene we wed in. Lay off Andy, pull your head in. I thought you were a man of note, but you rushed round like a hairy goat. Quit trying to pull me flaming sock off, or I'll forget I'm a lady and knock your block off. Say, what sort of a groom are you to start by bunging on a blue? Any more of this and I'll tell the minister that I'll finish me days as a dinkum spinister. Lay off the rough stuff. That's it, bub. Here's the wedding breakfast. Grab some grub. Now behave yourself and use some nouse. And have a cup of tea. It's grouse. Strike me lucky. Ain't love grand? Come on, Andy. Hold me hand. Remember, this is our wedding day, so let yourself go. You'll be okay. Don't gulp your food. Let the flavor linger. Eat like a lady. Use your finger. And hurry up. We're leaving soon. We're going on our honeymoon. Oh, what a thrill in a woman's life to think that at last she's become a wife. Well, come on, Andy. Time to go. Eat them grapes and then we'll blow. What's this? You're saying goodbye, me lad? No honeymoon? Fly me. We've been at. <laughs> For two months in Antarctica, the American Navy Task Force 68 returned to Wellington, New Zealand. Crew of the flagship Mount Olympus showed few signs of their battles with the ice flows. Leader of the force was the famous Admiral Richard Byrd, who at the age of 58 had completed his fourth polar expedition. Admiral Cruzan directed the three-ship team. New Zealand's Prime Minister Fraser welcomed back the intrepid explorer from the icy wastes. <laughs> The X-39 
expedition used a rocket-assisted ski plane to take off from the task force carrier for Little America. Even in this modern age, the Huskies were still essential cogs in the machine. During the trip, frogmen tested special suits in near freezing water temperatures and proved their efficiency. The boys did likewise by cooling off with some ice cream. A tremendous thrill for Admiral Byrd was the discovery on Little America of his camp established 15 years previously. The underground tunnel was just as it had been constructed. The Admiral and his men anxiously and excitedly worked their way through the underground ice house to find that the stocks of food were still in perfect condition, preserved in nature's refrigerator. Sides of beef, legs of ham. Well, not exactly tender. How about a pork chop, old chap? Sorry, I mean a pork chip. At the Institute of Anatomy in Canberra, top physicists from all over Australia gathered to exchange views and notes on atomic energy, particularly its application to the production of power for industry. Two leaders in this new scientific field were Sir Kerr Grant and his Adelaide-born colleague, Professor Marcus Oliphant, who, after many years in England, had established a worldwide reputation as a nuclear physicist, but remained unswerving in his opposition to the use of atomic energy in warfare. Australia can play a part in giving to the world the positive benefits of this new knowledge, some of which is of special importance for her own future. And may I say this, her sons and daughters who follow the paths of science are peculiarly fitted to help with the task which lies ahead. 300 miles north of Adelaide at Mount Painter in the Flinders Rangers, a party of politicians, including the South Australian Premier Mr. Playford and Army Minister Chambers, visited a uranium mine. It was a tough trip by jeep and on foot to the hillside hole in the arid wilderness. But the prospects of being able to obtain the valuable mineral in a state where power supply was meagre were of vital importance. Professor Oliphant had urged the development of the resources, the presence of which had been known for years. But now at last a positive approach was being made to explore the possibility of South Australia producing her own atomic energy power supply. And nearer still to the equator, over the rainforests of mountainous New Guinea, veteran pilot Arthur Jacobson took a movie cameraman to make the first newsreel record of the famous peak Mount Hagen. A beacon for the air armada in World War II when Australian troops were parachuted into the Markham Valley. Though it was peacetime again, one could not be blamed for uneasy feelings at the ferocious appearance of these natives. But it was just their way of saying, how do you do? Missionaries had long ago played their part in quietening the headhunting tendencies of these tribesmen. But their regalia remained as colourful as ever. They enjoyed their first appearance before the camera, and the crew were permitted to fly out of this lonely highland outpost with heads intact. A week of pageantry marked the celebrations for the sesquicentennial of Newcastle with a reenactment of the accidental discovery of the Hunter River by Lieutenant John Shortland while pursuing escaped convicts. The role of Lieutenant Shortland was played by his great-grandson, who planted the Union Jack on Horseshoe Beach near the spot where his ancestor landed 150 years previously. This landing party then headed Newcastle's biggest ever procession. At the saluting base, John Shortland watched the procession of floats and 5,000 marchers. The BHP float symbolised the industrial might of Newcastle, but it was the brewery float that received the number one vote from the thirsty workers. It was no accident, nor while chasing convicts, that Hume and Hobble discovered the Murray River on an overland trip from Sydney to Port Phillip Bay in 1824. And today, at the spot below War Memorial Hill, stands Albury. On July 10th, New South Wales Governor Northcott and the Mayor of Albury unveiled a plaque to raise the status of the town to that of a city.
census that year had fixed the population at 14,412, and Albury was officially listed as number 27 on the list of Australian cities. But in the Moree district of New South Wales, census takers with computers could not have even roughly estimated the population of grasshoppers, for it was plague time again, and the scavenging hordes in true biblical fashion were swarming through the countryside. It was the worst invasion in the area, and countless millions clouded the skies and blurred the vision of the helpless country folk as they winged their merciless way, devouring anything and everything that was green and growing. Having cleaned out the Moree cupboard, you see them here heading south, seeking fresh pastures upon which to satisfy their insatiable hunger. Another type of Sky Raider, also in countless millions. Hailstones cut a swathe across Sydney one January afternoon. It was one of the worst on record, and in only a few minutes caused more than a million dollars worth of damage as thousands of windows and tiles were shattered, in times when building materials were in shortest supply. Some stones exceeded a pound in weight and forced many people to crawl under their trucks and cars. 350 people were treated for cuts from flying glass. Victims of one of Sydney's worst icy air raids. After weathering the war years as a hospital ship, the popular 9,000 ton veteran of the Tasman crossing, Wonganella, came to a sudden stop on jagged Barrett's Reef at the entrance to Wellington Harbour. The Belfast-built warrior was the 15th vessel to strike this dangerous rocky outcrop, but fortunately the weather was calm and all 393 passengers were safely taken off. It was not until 19 days later that Tugs and Wonganella's engines were able to drag her clear and into Wellington, where listing heavily and with forehead holes flooded, she settled on the wharfside mud to undergo a long salvage convalescence. With a rapidly growing awareness of the menace of tuberculosis, clinics were established in all the larger cities in Australia. Mobile units appeared on the roads. At Randwick Racecourse, the Anti-TB Association's big van staged a mass survey of apprentices, stable hands and jockeys, with a particular object in view, to test whether wasting and fasting was a contributory factor in the spread of the disease. Darby Munro set an example to younger jockeys by taking his place in the 200-man queue. There's no entry fee in this race against the deadly scourge for which the promoters stage this photo finish to prevent you from having to say, if I'd only known. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very pleased to have won the premiership, the premiership today. But I think I'm very fortunate. If uh, George Moore hadn't have broke his leg, I think well, Thompson and I'd be racing for second place. Thank you. Eggs fly at Flemington for a national occasion, the Melbourne Cup Carnival, which makes all Australia hold its breath in excitement and suspense. You can feel the tension on Derby Day. While Scott drops out and fresh boys unwinding his great run. A furlong from home, Araji seems to have no opposition, but here comes fresh boy wide out going great guns. Fresh boy cuts in on the rails but fails to catch Haraji. Red Fury third, Proctor fourth, then Royal Scott conductor, Clatterbag, Amelia and Gaynor. Raji, you little beauty. A slow motion repeat shows the contrasting riding styles of the first two jockeys. Pertell balanced well forward and riding with hands and heels. The apprentice Eames sitting back and laying on the whip as he cuts in behind Haraji to finish along the rails half a length away from the winner.
Easter at Stall in Victoria and the final of the Stall Gift, the richest and most famous professional foot race in the world. From 28 heats, the field had been cut to five for the final 130-yard dash. Frank Banner from Sydney on the near side was a 6-4 to four on favourite. Then Arthur Martin from Ballarat, Les Street from Lismore, DJ Gardner from Coburg and O.S. Burton from Newmarket. A triumph for the handicapper. Judges claimed that no more than a foot covered the field at the tape, with Martin's second favourite at 4-1 to one and Gardner a 20-1 to one outsider named as the first dead heaters in the history of the famous event. Later the same afternoon in the runoff, Martin off four yards triumphed by inches over Gardner off the eight-yard mark. It was November 11th at Sydney Cricket Ground, but there was certainly no armistice between an Australian 11 captained by Don Bradman and the touring Indians. The home side had lost two for 32 when Bradman, the man who delighted cricket crowds in England and Australia for 20 years, was joined by Keith Miller. The name Bradman had become synonymous with the word century, and this, if he could do it, was to be his century of centuries. Mercilessly, ruthlessly, he took apart the Indian bowling. Powerful, daring, exhilarating in his self-confident artistry. With Bradman in the 90s, it seemed as though the whole ground was holding its breath, and everyone, including Bradman, was too intense to see the joke when the Indian captain brought on Kirchenshan to bowl his only over of the tour. Then with a single came a century. The crowd cheered. Before his career ended, 16 more centuries were to flow from his incomparable bats, retiring after having scored 28,067 runs, including 37 innings of 200 or more. Unorthodox, unscientific, Don Bradman. It was a vintage year for Sydney fight fans when 27-year-old George's River oyster farmer Vic Patrick met New Yorker Eddie Marcus. Just two minutes and ten seconds after the opening of the first round, Patrick's loaded left rip sent Marcus to the canvas for the full count. went home more convinced than ever that Vic was in world class. The 3rd of March that year is remembered as the date of one of the most thrilling encounters ever staged at Sydney Stadium. 12,300 crammed the famous arena as Tommy Burns faced the highly rated glistening Negro O'Neill Bell. From the first gong it was on, the fans roared themselves hoarse. The local boy, battered, bleeding and dazed, weathered the storm. Grimly he fought back. By the end of the 10th, Burns had even up the point score and was on the offensive. An unbelievable recovery. It was a fantastic non-stop slugging match. They threw punches from memory. It was a question of who had the most guts. In the 11th, Bell wilted and crumbled into semi-conscious submission. And Tommy Burns established himself as one of the greatest draw cards. It was not until two and a half years later that Kevin Delaney was able to take the welter title from him. Then on September the 1st came the Patrick Dawson epic. No fight in Australia this century has caused greater controversy. Freddie Dawson, another power-punching Negro, was in world class. This was Patrick's chance to vindicate the faith of his supporters in his prowess. For a while, Dawson was nonplussed by Vic's fierce southpaw attack, but experience and class earned Dawson an early points advantage. Came the memorable 11th round. Urged on by the Roaring Capacity House, Patrick stalked Dawson, seeking an opening for his deadly left. But the wily Negro took no risks. Then, as the round drew to a close, the tempo quickened. Patrick launched a terrific onslaught, and Dawson went down through the ropes. Did the bell save him? Was he really hurt? These are questions still argued to this day. But Patrick was the one to make a mistake. Eager to get in for the kill immediately the 12th round open, he lowered his guard, and in a flash, Dawson crossed him with a right, and Vic went down. No sooner was he back on his feet than he was crossed again. This time, Vic stayed down and woke up in St. Vincent's Hospital.
In a split second, victory had slipped from the grasp of Vic Patrick for only the third occasion in a 55-bout career, 43 of which he won by knockout. A memorable night in 1947, a year to remember.